So welcome to our co-creation workshop on just urban mobility transitions. We're really excited to have you here as part of the National SDG Conference and Day Zero. And uh, I'm joined, I'm Siddharth Sareen. I'm a researcher at the University of Bergen and an associate professor at the University of Stavanger. And I'm joined by uh, two colleagues also at the Center for Climate and Energy Transformation at the University of Bergen. That's Devin uh, Remme and uh, Katinka Voxetter. Um, Devin and Katinka, would you like to say a, say a couple of words just to say hi? Hello, I'm Devin. Um, I uh, work with Sid on researching sustainable mobility in Bergen, and I'm excited to uh, present for you guys today. Hey everyone, my name is Katinka Lundvogsetta. I'm also with Sid's team at the University of Bergen, and yeah, looking forward to hear what you all have um, to share today. So we've got a lot in store for you, and uh, we wanted to make sure we warm you up to the theme. We've been doing a lot of uh, work, both empirical fieldwork and thinking and reading and writing around this theme in Bergen for the last half a year now. And uh, there's also been other colleagues uh, who've uh, been part of this, so it's been a really fun time. But um, we want to make use of these next 90 minutes mainly to involve you and also learn from you by giving you some sense of what we've been finding and then uh, involving you in that discussion. So um, I'll start by saying a bit about the theme, which is just urban mobility transitions. And that theme is really about bringing together two different priorities. One is decarbonization. And that is, as I'm sure all of you are familiar with, um, related to the challenge of reducing carbon and other greenhouse gas emissions really rapidly globally. Of course, uh, this happens in many different parts of the world and uh, there are many different targets being set, many activities that are decided on much more locally, sometimes by countries, but often by cities, often by actors within particular contexts. And so when we think of decarbonization in the mobility sector um, in Norway and in Bergen, one of the key ways to decarbonize is to electrify transport altogether. And that's because in Norway, we have a lot of renewable energy, mostly hydropower from a lot of the dams that have existed in this country for a long time now. Also some wind power that's in increasingly a source as well going ahead. And uh, a linked part of decarbonizing transport along with electrifying it is to digitize it. Now, this is a bit harder to get your head around. So I'll break it down to you a little bit. And digitizing here is about enabling real-time flows of information about energy use, about need. And that's because it's a complex system when you plug in any kind of transport uh, vehicle, whether it's a bus or a light rail or car or cargo bicycle um, into the grid, you're introducing more demand on the electric grid than it has had because you're really electrifying a whole different sector that consumes massive energy. Most of this has been fed by fossil fuels so far. Some bits like the light rail in Bergen have all, already been electrified uh, from before. Um, but what we need to do in order to have such a transition is to have real-time flows of information that make sure that the stability of the system, its reliability are not compromised. So the transition has to not only be away from carbon emissions, but also one that retains the elements of mobility that we really pride ourselves on, that we rely on, that everything works and that it doesn't stop other parts of our life um, from functioning, like switching on the lights in a room or uh, heating or cooking, all of which uh, are electricity based for the most part in Norway and Bergen. The second part of uh, this agenda then of just mobility transitions is about democratization. And that refers for us to two different kinds of things. One is to make sure that there's a basic minimum level of service provision in terms of public transport for everyone, not just for people living in the center of the city, um, not just for people living in the suburbs, um, but for everyone. And here we focus on the urban scale. So we're focused very much on the larger area of Bergen. But um, Norway, as uh, many of you might be aware, has a very complex geography. And so really, we also have to consider uh, flows of people in and out of the city from the larger surrounding 
region, a lot of jobs exist in, uh, in cities uh, such as Bergen. The other part is though quite specific to both the city center and to many of the suburban areas of the city. And it's really spread out. It's located uh, within seven mountains. I know that in a moment, Katinka will show you a, a photo that uh, nicely places you within this beautiful city. Um, and there's a lot of competition for space, for public space. And a lot of this is taken up um, today still by car parking, by people moving around in ways that then as part of the just mobility transition, we would like to see changed so that there's more opportunity for squares, for people moving around by foot, by bike, hanging out outdoors. And uh, that's something that we're working on for the next few years as part of a project called Responsive Organizing for Low Emission Societies. This has partners from the UK, from Italy, and our role in it is really to focus on urban mobility transitions happening in Bergen. And, uh, and it's also a really interesting context because at least on electric cars, um, Bergen is one of the leaders globally on uh, being able to electrify more than 80% of sales of uh, cars in, uh, in Norway these months have actually been electric. So we're seeing a rapid phase out here of a sort that many um, countries want to emulate. The Super Bowl uh, just some days ago had an ad that was trying to uh, compete with Norway for uh, being ahead on that kind of transition. But we're not convinced that that's the only kind of transition as you might have uh, gathered. So we'll come back to some of these themes. Just a word about the format. We share some emerging findings from our case study in Bergen. And uh, both Katinka and Devin will take you through this. Devin will especially um, focus in on one part of the kind of mobility transitions that are happening in Bergen that's around car-free zoning. So creating different neighborhoods uh, that have space for non-motorized transport and public space. Um, and then we'll put you to work in small groups and we'll assign you the roles of stakeholders. We'll use a breakout rooms function on Zoom. That part will not be recorded. Um, we will give you a concrete task in each of these groups. And then we'll bring you back into plenary and ask you to do some live action role play using the identity that you've discussed in your group. So you'll have to remember to have one person nominated. We'll do two rounds of this. And uh, at the end, we will come in with some closing reflections on what we learned about just mobility transitions from this co-creative process that, uh, that we undertake together. And finally, a word about uh, the timing. So we'll only spend the first half hour on, uh, on giving you a bit of input um, based on our research so far and explaining the group work task. I'll come back in to, uh, to specify it a little bit. And then we'll do two rounds. So you'll be able to not only have a go at doing a live uh, version of interacting with each other and uh, playing the role of different stakeholders, but also reflect on this and come back and have other representatives from your group do something similar a second time and we'll make it a bit more free flowing. And then we'll come back uh, in just to wrap up and to close. And with that, I will uh, hand over to Katinka who will take you into Bergen and its mobility transition. Thank you, Sid. I'm just gonna share screen. Okay, there we go. Okay, um, so as, Bo, as uh, Sid mentioned, I'm gonna talk a bit about the Just Mobility Transitions work research that we've been doing here in Bergen in the last six months. And I apologize to those of you who are based in Bergen. Uh, who may know some of this from before, but, but this presentation is angled towards the international audience, um, people who don't know Bergen that well. <clears throat> so Bergen is quite a, a small city in the global context. We've got about 280,000 inhabitants. It's, as Sid mentioned, a, a mountainous city, and it's also incredibly rainy, as you may, might have heard. Um, we've also got a very low popu population density. With this, um, we've got high car dependence. So over half of our commuters uh, depend on private vehicles um, for, their, for the commutes, either as a driver or as a passenger. Bergen also has high ambitions for direct emission cuts. 
So at the moment, we are aiming to reduce direct emissions by 50% by 2023. So that's within three years of now. And we're also aiming to be fossil free by 2030. So then if we look at the Bergen emission profile, and here are the numbers from, uh, based on numbers from 2018, transport by land, so private vehicles, buses, trucks, uh, transport vans, etc., are responsible for 56% of the emissions. So it's obvious that in order to reach our emission targets, uh, big changes are needed in the transport system. And our focus here today is going to be on transport by land, um, focusing on people transport, so not transport of goods, uh, trucks and vans, etc. So just to first highlight some of the important policies and goals that are help, helping us uh, make this shift. So at a national level, we've got something called the zero growth goal, which means zero growth in private vehicle transport. Mm. And I think there's someone who's got their mic on who please turn their mic off. Um, and so this zero growth goal is mandated through the national transport plan and it's enabled through what we call the city growth agreements. These are agreements between the national state, the county and the metropolitan municipalities, so the cities, and in some cases also with surrounding municipalities. And the agreement is key to enabling important funding mechanisms towards the expansion of uh, public transport systems. Bergen does have one of these agreements in place, um, but Bergen also has higher ambitions. So there's a drive to become Norway's greenest city and to reduce private vehicle transport by 30% by 2023. And so this goal is mandated through the, the Bergen City Vision, which is a political platform document of the the city's ruling party coalition at the moment. And the vision or the goal uh, and ambitions are also echoed through different components of the Bergen Municip Municipal Plan and related strategies. But so how is the city of Bergen, plan Bergen planning to do this and currently already underway doing this? So overall, um, Bergen is aiming to reduce the need for mobility. So through densification and ensuring that everyone's essential needs are to be found in their neighborhood, they're hoping to reduce people's need to move around. At the same time, they're working to electrify bus fleets, um, the rail, light rail, um, ferries, etc., as well as private vehicles. And they're trying to move people from the private vehicle over to walking, cycling, and public transport. So there's a number of interventions happening, and they're driven through complex cross-scalar social, economic, planning, and political forces, actors, and actions. And I'm going to highlight, just run through them quickly. If we go through them in detail, it would take way too long. Uh, so a key aspect is the light rail expansion. So this stands at the center of Bergen public transport. And it's referred to as the spine of the Bergen public transport system. It's kind of seen as the holy grail uh, of public transport in Bergen, you could say, uh, in the way it's, it's referred to in documents and in discourse. Secondly, we've got densification, and this is mandated mainly through the new spatial planning directive that came, uh, that was uh, approved in 2019. And here we are strategically concentrating further property developments in the city and al along the light rail tracks. Then we've got focus on enabling city cycling and walking. There's a cycling strategy. There's a bike sharing scheme happening in the city. Then a very important one that's been quite controversial in the Bergen uh, context is the disincentivization of private vehicle use, especially fossil fuel vehicles through car tolls and currently through uh, reduced parking availability in the city center. There's also electrical vehicle sub subsidies happening from a national scale. And then we've got 
car-free zones, which my colleague Devin will be uh, focusing in on um, after my presentation. We've got the rollout of car charge infrastructure, mobility hubs, park and ride, car sharing, expanded bus services, and electrification of buses, boats, and ferries. But, so there's a lot of happening and it's driven by actors at different spatial scales and implemented at different time scales. So what we've tried to do is looking at the totality of these changes that are currently underway and to highlight the overall justice implications, who benefits and who doesn't. And so as it turns out, identifying overall justice implication through an overarching look of the system is very difficult unless you zoom in on one component at the time. The different interventions are affecting each other over time. And there is also the complication of personal choice. Different people make different priorities and have different trade-offs in relation to, for example, where they choose to live and where they can live, uh, and also where they choose to go and where they have to go. And this is linked to and limited by or enabled by their economic status, affordability. So it's therefore hard to single out two experiences injustice or where there's more or less injustice in the transport system. But what we have done is identify some concerning trends that could complicate or even derail the transport and mobility transition in Bergen. So firstly, and I believe Sid referred to this in the, in the opening plenary, um, the ability to buy your way out in the current uh, transition. So essentially, if you have the financial means, you can buy your way out of a, the inconvenience of a shifting transport system or out of a bad conscience of driving a fossil fuel vehicle. You can choose to live in a space where you could walk uh, uh, or use public transport or cycle to the places that you need to go or you could buy an electric vehicle. These are aspects that are less accessible to those with, uh, with less financial means. Then there's the aspect of growing spatial inequality. As housing prices rise in the densified light rail connected parts of the city. And what we've argued in our research is that um, part of the, the issue here and the challenge is the strong role of the private sector uh, in property development in the city. And the fact that in Norway, we have a market-based property sector. This means that local government has very limited ability to ensure mixed income housing in these densified uh, densification zones of the city. Lastly, uh, we have some concern, even though we're excited about the light rail system, we have some concern around the overemphasis and investment in the light rail at the potential expense of the bus service. This could further marginalize those who cannot uh, live along the densified spine. So unless we have a sufficient focus on an investment also given into the bus system. And with that, Overview, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Devin, who is uh, going to zoom in to car free zones and what's happening there. Thank you. And then I'm going to stop sharing screen. Okay, hello. <laughs> So uh, almost every city in the world has uh, some sort of focus on making their mobility system more sustainable. Um, but we don't always know uh, what policies will work and how they hang together. So in 2007, a researcher named Holden did an in-depth analysis of the most common sustainable mobility policies um, and projected their likely impacts. And what he found was that while expanding public transportation and building infrastructure for walking and cycling have positive effects, alone they are not enough to achieve a shift away from automobility. In order to do that, you need simultaneous actions to restrict car use. 
so Katinka mentioned congestion tolls, but also removing parking spaces and creating car-free zones. And these measures are both practical and symbolic. They make it harder and less convenient to drive in the city, but they also send a signal that automobility is no longer a priority for public investment. Uh, and you might be wondering why restricting car use is so important uh, if we can switch to electric vehicles. Uh, Sid mentioned earlier that Bergen is the global leader in adopting electric vehicles. Uh, over 20% of our car fleet is already electric. Um, so why do cities like Bergen have a zero growth in traffic goal rather than a zero emissions goal? And there are a lot of reasons for that. The first one is that cars take up a lot of space and they are highly subsidized. Uh, the second is that electric vehicles are actually not emissions free if you look at their entire life cycles. So uh, the mining and processing of raw materials, the manufacturing of cars, the infrastructure for charging and uh, of course roads uh, all make electric vehicles just like traditional cars highly resource intensive. So when it comes to scaling up cars, uh, electric or not, the global and local impacts are highly inequitable. So car free zones uh, are usually not entirely car free. They often uh, allow cars for uh, handicapped people and also for delivering goods and um, some other necessities. And the essential point is that we want to remove cars to make space for people. When it comes to promoting non-motorized mobility, like walking and cycling, um, research has shown that creating car-free zones uh, motivates people to make a trip by walking and cycling that they might have otherwise used their car for. And here's a picture from Bergen's uh, first car-free zone. So getting people to switch from cars to other modes is important, but car-free zones are more than that. They are experiments in creating desirable urban futures that put people in the center. So in Bergen, you can see here a picture from the first center they created, uh, zone in the center. And this area was actually uh, built before the dominance of cars and it has good access to public transportation. Um, and it also had organized neighborhood groups, several of them that were calling for this change. And that made it easier when, when planners uh, finally got the go ahead from uh, the politicians to do this project there were already these groups ready to engage in participati participatory processes. Uh, this was hailed as a big success. So the current city government prioritized expanding these zones in the center, but also creating car-free zones in every suburb. And suburban car-free zones have some challenges that weren't present in these pilot projects. Uh, first of all, they were designed after cars were widespread. So uh, the, the layout of these places is different. Um, and second of all, there aren't really pre-organized groups that are calling for this change. Uh, the city center primarily voted for the party that's pushing for car-free zones, but the suburbs primarily voted for a party that represents car users um, and they want to abolish toll roads. So the planners will have their uh, work cut out for them. Um, they have already started by mapping out potential areas and uh, selecting a first area in the suburbs to start with. Um, and next they will inform the public of where it's going to be and start creating um, opportunities for people to participate in the next planning stages. And the, the planners don't always have a lot of training or experience in participatory planning methods. Um, we, can, we conducted a workshop with the planners that are working on this project, and we also interviewed a lot of different mobility planners in Bergen. And we found that they have a strong commitment to um, including the public, not just informing them, but uh, really creating uh, deep participatory processes. And we also found that they view their work as experimental because when you're doing something that hasn't been done before, it's, you have to learn by doing. And that means that 
um, planning and implementing these projects isn't just knowledge based, but it's knowledge producing as well. And part of their task will be figuring out what elements make participatory processes meaningful and inclusive, especially in this uh, new context where a significant portion of the local people might consider this intervention to be uh, unnecessary or intrusive or even insulting. So car-free zones are not just about restricting a form of mobility that doesn't fit with sustainable agendas, but they're also about changing the character of places. And places are, are lived. They are defined by the meanings that people attach to them. So in order for a place to be experienced positively, the people who live there have to feel some sense of ownership. If they're left feeling that the interventions came from people they didn't vote for, and it represents policies that are um, perceived as unfair or meant to punish them, the new car-free zones run the risk of further entrenching attitudes against sustainable transitions. So the hope is that these new zones will be lived in and treasured. Um, and one of the aspirations is to create public meeting places, especially in the suburbs where the major public meeting place is uh, the large shopping centers. Um, and in an age where we are increasingly polarized and living in digital bu bubbles, um, opportunities for encounter and socialization are even more important. Uh, so some, you can see in these pictures, there's uh, some different ideas for what can be done in these zones. Um, often areas for children to play, uh, areas for older people to uh, socialize. There's been installations with like exercise and workout equipment, um, community events like street fairs and secondhand markets. Um, and urban agriculture is growing in popularity. And there's, there's been several empirical studies on different benefits. Uh, and one of them is that uh, there's a correlation between having access to a, a private garden or, an, or a public urban garden and reduced leisure travel by car and plane. So this uh, contributes to the goal of not just electrifying and substituting modes, but also maybe reducing the need to move around so much especially in carbon intensive uh, ways. So whatever the specific designs and activities that end up in these car-free zones, we know that they should reflect a local sense of place. And ideally they should contribute to making space for low carbon logics more generally. So it follows that public participation is crucial. Uh, uh, one example of making more inclusive spaces for participation could be uh, offering childcare for the public meetings so that more people with small children can join. Or another idea um, that they've explored in Bergen is finding ways to get the perspectives of children on uh, how they see the spaces they move around in and what they would like to see. Uh, so uh, I'll end by posing uh, two questions, provocations for you to think about before handing it back to my colleague, Sid. Um, and that the first is, if you let your imagination go wild and picture what could be possible in these spaces once we remove cars. And the second is, how can these planning processes be more participatory, more inclusive, and more productive for co-designing common spaces? Um, thank you. I will uh, hand it back to Sid now. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> Meanwhile, there's a question about where the, the images are from. If you want to. Ah, um, so uh, the, the previous image was from Bergen. These are from many different cities. You can see um, the one uh, towards the bottom with the Ferris wheel, that's also Bergen. That used to be a large parking lot right in the city center. Um, and now it is, uh, that's a market, but sometimes it's an open space. A lot of things happen there. Um, you see this one up in the top left corner, that's in San Francisco. Um, they originally st uh, started by making it wavy just so that cars didn't go so fast because they were um, hitting people. <laughs> uh, and then they went over to full uh, car-free areas. Um, I think this one in the right corner is Madrid with the agriculture. 
Uh, and then we have Oslo in the other corner, uh, bottom corner. Yeah. Thanks. Um, great. So uh, Devin's uh, brought us nicely into um, the next bit of our program, which is to uh, to do some live action role play, which some of you might know as LARPing. And, um, and that is on Bergen's Car Free Zones. So she's given you a couple of uh, challenges here, if you like, on what you would do if you imagined them and let your imagination run wild. Um, at the same time, I'd say uh, it's important to think in realistic terms that might be ambitious, might even be radical, but to also come up with pathways for how to actually make them happen. Now, one interesting book I wanted to mention that came out last year is by Ulrich Erikson, pictured here, who wrote, and I'll translate to English for our international audience, a, a country on four wheels, how the automobile uh, conquered Norway. And, uh, and I mentioned this, uh, Ulrich's also going to talk about this at the Literature Festival in Bergen, which is online later this week. Um, but uh, I mentioned this because there's a whole history as uh, we've mentioned in different ways now, to the role of cars and to the imaginary of mobility in a Norwegian setting and in Bergen. So for instance, um, here, this is another photo of uh, Molen Priest taken from the municipality. Um, this is uh, you know, the first car-free zone. It's in the city center, as uh, Devin mentioned. Um, these are imaginary. Some of them are made real. The challenge of doing this in suburban areas of the city is one that uh, is still in the process of vision making. But there are also some other imaginaries, not only at the city scale, but nationally. One of them is, the, is Norway's uh, automobile uh, automobile um, association, which is called NAF, and uh, their logo is pictured here. Now, uh, they're a very organized interest group of car owners, car users around uh, the country. Um, they, you know, offer lots of uh, solidaric services to that user group. We noticed in the course of this project that uh, that there isn't a bus users association, for instance. And uh, this is a bit of a provocation. We even made a website uh, called busforbund.no uh, um, and this teaser logo of what a busbrukernesforbund, such an association, what it could look like. And I mentioned these to highlight the point that there are multiple stakeholders um, in any kind of conversation about uh, mobility transition. There are going to be contested opinions and narratives and it's important to organize and to organize as multiple groups, even those who might be quite marginalized voices in the current conversation, in order to work towards a cooperative vision of what that transition can look like to be truly just, to be inclusive. And so what better than to use this opportunity today to help us model it by uh, making use of the fact that all of you are with us. We're going to assign you roles and give you a couple of questions. Um, these are also questions we'll make available in the chat going into breakout rooms. What can car-free zones in every neighborhood in Bergen do for you? And what can you do for them? And the roles here are that of a city council politician, that of an urban planner enabling Bergen's mobility transition, that of a local activist, and we leave it to you to parse this to decide on the priorities of this activist. Are there social considerations? Are there um, ecological considerations? And then two different kinds of residents. Of course, there are many diverse kinds of residents and mobility needs, but we wanted to, and this is also reflecting what the debate in Bergen around mobility transitions has uh, been portrayed as quite commonly in, in recent years, the role of a suburban resident and of a city center resident. So when you enter the breakout rooms in a couple of minutes, you will have 10 minutes. You will see the name of one or the other of these stakeholders at the top of your breakout room. And in groups of about half a dozen each, um, we would like you to spend 10 minutes discussing the response to this question from the perspective of your stakeholder. What can car-free zones in every neighborhood in Bergen do for you? And what can you do for them? How would you enable the kind of vision that you would like to see? Um, and after 10 minutes, you will be brought back into plenary. We will record the plenary proceedings. It's important in the 10 minutes in your breakout room that you assign one representative from your group who will take on the role of that stakeholder and represent all of your perspectives. 
the way we'll structure it will be to have a max of two minutes per stakeholder who conveys what you've discussed in your group. And then to have a minute for rebuttal after we've been through each to be able to engage with and reflect on um, what, the, what the other stakeholders have put forward. And then we'll reiterate this. I'll give you slightly more detailed instructions about the second round, but you will have an opportunity to go back into a breakout group and reflect on what you've heard and come back into a more free-flowing discussion where we will uh, let things be more spontaneous and uh, not, not moderate the format so closely, reflecting a participatory process as well. So with that, I will uh, move you into your rooms. If you have any trouble, um, you will be able to come back in here and, uh, and check with me. All right, and remember you have 10 minutes. Good luck. Great, welcome back. So you've had a chance to discuss this in groups. And now we'll enter the live action role play for the next 15 minutes. First, I'd like a representative from each of the groups going in the same order as, uh, as we discussed to come forward and take up to two minutes. I will cut you off if you exceed that time. Take two minutes to explain uh, your perspective as a stakeholder. We start with the city council politician. So um, what we discussed, we discussed a, a couple of things. So one of the, the first things that we talked about was how local politicians will want to, um, to take care of two interests. So uh, both the interests of uh, the population because their purpose is to gather votes, but also to take into account other interests and lobbying. Uh, when it comes to gathering votes, we talked about how um, it will depend on whether most people want these kinds of spaces. And uh, what uh, was discussed is that people will tend to want spaces where they can feel that their children can be um, playing in the city safely and also uh, have more leisure uh, activities. On the other hand, we also talked about how low, there has been a general uh, shift of cities towards uh, an agenda of sustainability and uh, a local politician kind of comes into this uh, framework uh, and this is a general trend, not just to one individual uh, city. And finally, uh, what we discussed was that as a politician, um, once we advance with these solutions of car-free zones, a politician also needs to always think about what are then the solutions for mobility. Um, so if we transform uh, a space into a car-free zone, then a politician also has to think about other solutions for people who actually need a car and live in close to areas that are car-free. And this is, uh, I think, what we discussed. Thank you from, for the politicians. Now we move on to hearing from an urban planner. Do we have a nominee from the uh, group that uh, discussed the urban planners? Right? That, 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 could, that could be me, Tore Nikolaisen. Uh, uh, we obviously discussed uh, some of the issues just mentioned and also as uh, the presentations has uh, pointed out then. Uh, there was an example come up, coming up in the discussion, uh, uh, which we can call, uh, in a way, bottom-up uh, planning. And that is to rely upon local initiative, uh, which are severely felt by people living in an area. And that is very important concerning public participation in planning, which has been, uh, which we have been aware of in Norway both concerning from professional life, as maybe I uh, kind of represent here. I have also been a politician, just to put that out uh, in my, in some, for some 20 years ago. Uh, and the question really is how to create the good uh, life in the city surroundings and uh, where, where there is a lot to gain. Um, and uh, in the first place, the discussion should be around how to involve people, how to channelize and how to kind of uh, study what people kind of, what, what opinion people are having before involving them so that there is a thinking 
which uh, has to be uh, good enough to to handle uh, people's opinions, because else there can be kind of circus concerning the, those meetings. Uh, the other or the the fourth uh, issue is to how to rethink the system and how to plan for uh, rethinking the system and how to involve still the people in discussion on, on uh, how to rethink it and redesign it into, for instance, like uh, which the issue is here then, car-free zones. My experience through local to being uh, through being a local politician and also being a part of a city uh, politician, I, I, I don't remember the English expression for it, but um, uh, in Norway there has been through several years uh, parts of the city has been having their own political kind of um, uh, organization and it's very important that uh, local initiatives are channelized through politicians in the first place involving the politicians in the discussion for uh, the moment and we'll hear next from a local activist I, I guess that's me partially because when uh, Claudia said okay Katharina you do it we were two Katharinas and I said yes but yeah anyway <laughs> I'm sure the other Katharina can help out if I forget some points. So what we as activists talked about, we, we assume the stance of a uh, social and also environmental activist, which is kind of the norm for a lot of activists we've seen in Bergen anyway, that we have this dual focus. Um, and of course, what green spaces can and car free science can do for us is to radically change our modes of transportation and uh, uh, also give us the opportunity to have a lot more communal gardens, which is especially good for us who are local environmental activists, that we can, you know, help the bumblebees, as we said, and, uh, have more local biodiversity. And uh, of course, also a better quality of air, especially for a lot of us young activists, that is quite a, a big concern uh, in, in the city as well. Um, and what we as activists can do for this, for the car-free zones, is we can help to turn it into a positive social movement, which I believe is kind of the biggest challenge that things like this face, the way we frame it, the way we present it as giving us access to more goods rather than taking away a necessity, which would be the car to a lot of people. Um, we can help work to uh, increase community engagement in the, uh, in the zones themselves and uh, you know, as activists, we're probably, you know, out there making posters and trying to engage with the community. And uh, uh, I think we can also, as uh, we can also help the, the urban planner, actually, when you were talking about that, when Nicolais and I just thought, you know, how to engage people. Oh, well, that's kind of our job, isn't it? You know, being out there having those debates, being colorful and visible and presenting this as a good alternative to the current way cities are organized. I think that was most of what we talked about. Hey, oh, <laughs> okay. Then we will move to the suburban resident now. Yes, um, car-free zones for suburban residents are kind of a complicated issue because we rely on the car to commute. We rely on the car for many of our trips. And um, yeah, we've been thinking about, yeah, what, what, what can car-free zones actually help us with? Um, and what we, what we came up with is that car-free zones can actually help us to, to create a sense of um, social cohesion, to increase that a bit, to get to know our neighbors, to make um, more public space available, um, to actually talk about issues that concern us as residents of that particular suburb. Um, so in a sense, we are, we are one step prior to actually solving, solving mobility issues in that we, I mean, we don't have a, we don't have a means to, to actually not to use our cars right now. So first of all, we need to we need to talk about what we actually want and need uh, with regards to mobility in our suburb. And I mean, it can help to to create to create a car-free zone where where our kids can play. I mean, that's the major concern for us that we, like Devin showed, have have the Lego spaces where we can have our kids play together. But also, outdoor gyms might be a cool idea, particularly in times of pandemic of the pandemic. It's really hard to meet people indoors, so. Um, Right now, it would be a good idea to create these uh, safe meeting places for people. Uh, we haven't really talked about um, what we can do for them, but we see it more in the responsibility maybe <laughs> of, our, 
of our local of our local politicians to um, to to guide us through that and also present us with ways on how car free zones can can actually help us. Thank you. Then we move to our last stakeholder, the city centre resident. Yes. Yeah, so we imagined a car free zone to be a lot more open and uh, a lot more quiet area where it would be ch safe for children to play. And uh, a lot of adults today maybe feel like they're not connected to their neighbors. So it would be an opportunity to have different uh, activities and meetings. So a lot of, so the neighbors would be more connected. Um, there is upsides and downsides to this. Of course, it's uh, to be able to live in the city center uh, in a safe and enjoyable area is very lucrative. So uh, we're thinking maybe if there's a lot of people renting, the rent might increase. So there's that to consider. Um, as for what we could do for the car free area is um, these uh, happenings, they don't come by themselves. We have to make sure something is happening uh, or else it's just an empty area. So we have to take responsibility and uh, make sure there's uh, always something happening. Uh, we also have to make sure there's not a lot of clutter, broken glass, etc. So that it's a safe area for children and so on to play. And uh, as we've seen in Bergen, uh, as the electric scooters came, for example, there has been a lot of discussion about where these scooters should be parked. Um, so I think there would have to be some rules about not leaving uh, electric scooters and bikes and etc. just hanging around. Thank you. Great, so now we've heard um, uh, brief uh, reflections from each of the stakeholders. We go cycling back in the same order and you have a minute to be able to respond to or give a rebuttal to any of the concerns that the other stakeholders have raised. So we start again with the local, the city council politician. Um, I didn't understand the task. Now you can respond to any of the other stakeholders based on what they have said, if you objected to something or are in support. And someone else from your group may want to chime in as well. I think, uh, hi. I think regarding the um, uh, suburban uh, citizens, I think we, we, we we, uh, Marta already kind of mentioned this, that we were conscious that uh, we need to find solutions for those who need their cars, right? So why do they need their cars? They need to be uh, taken into consideration. And then uh, how can we work to, to fill those uh, needs together with uh, um, giving those car-free zones for those that want them for, as it was mentioned, for meeting your neighbors and uh, allowing your children to play and having uh, gardens uh, yeah but okay. exactly how to do this uh, no i'm not offering any solution <laughs> we'll get there um the the urban planner next please i don't know if agnes wanted to chime in there because she had some good insights also um But I thought it was interesting that uh, Katarina, as the activist, said that um, one of the things you could do for the zones was to work with the planners and to like be um, uh, a good um, partner, we say in Norwegian, uh, um, to work together. And uh, it's interesting because um, often activists get put in the role of um, opposition, that uh, either planners or politicians are, if not the enemy, they are like, they have... Um, maybe they have been naive about something and your role is to uh, let them know how they're messing it up. <laughs> so um, let's hear from the, the local activists then. Are there any quick reflections off the floor? Maybe I will try to reply to this provocation like uh, in a practical way. Yes, of course. I mean, the, the collaboration and cooperation among all stakeholders is crucial. And 
as you say, local activists should play the opposition role. So my my point is, from a very practical point of view, when let's say we have this interesting proposal and um, sustainable project, or let's say communal gardens or whatever leisure activities, the urban planner or in general, all the stakeholders has to go in the same direction. Otherwise, the, the system is not going to work. Great. Can I, can I also very quickly yeah. chime in as well? Okay, cheers. Uh, I thought of it uh, partially because I am a member of Extinction Rebellion and we're actually working and going to try to install a uh, citizens assembly. So it's kind of like we're already trying to cooperate and like create more political spaces for citizen engagement in questions such as these. So I think some activist group can, groups can play uh, that kind of like tal surur, again in Norwegian, I don't know the English word, but like a channel of communication between different parts as well. I think activists have a role there that might be underutilized. Thanks. And we hear from the suburban residents if you have any immediate uh, responses. Okay, then, then I'll just continue, um, maybe directly to the local council politician. Convince us that, that car-free zones do something for us. I mean, the majority of us hasn't voted for you. Um, so if you want, to, if you want um, us to vote for you, convince us that uh, car-free zones are actually a good idea and how they can help us. Great, short and to the point there. And uh, finally, the city center resident, do you have something to reflect on here? So I would uh, direct this to the suburbs. Um, you're saying a uh, car-free zone doesn't do anything for you, but uh, uh, a car-free zone in the middle of the center is uh, very good for you because you can take public transport into the city center. And then there's a lot of opportunity for micro mobility, like electric scooters and bikes to get around where you want to go. Thank you. So now we've had a chance to uh, do a couple of rounds in a structured way. And uh, we'll give you a chance to go back into your breakout groups, but just for five minutes this time. And then when we come back, we'll have a bit more of a, an unstructured 15 minutes where, uh, where you're, it's no holds barred. You're welcome to speak up. Just make sure each time you uh, start by stating your identity. And uh, to make it a bit exciting, we'll stop saying this is something our group thought and really play the role of the actor and say, I don't agree with this because we, and so on. So let's give that a go and, uh, and see how we go. You have five minutes, it's still the same question and uh, you can speak as you like, you can assign a role or you can agree that anybody from your group will feel free to speak in the moment. Okay, so uh, see you in five minutes again. All right, here we are. So I'm really interested in hearing from all of you now. What can car-free zones in every neighborhood in Bergen do for you and what can you do for them? Remember to mention your stakeholder identity before you speak. Go. Who's the brave uh, first soul to come out? Well, as a local councilman, uh, politician, um, from the right wing of the political spectrum, I, I have to say I'm a bit concerned about the local businesses. Um, you know, when we make these car-free zones, uh, it will be more difficult for the uh, residents and the, our customers to get to, to visit these local stores. So I think that's, that, that's going to be a, something we have to think about. Um, and our local uh, businesses are already suffering from the pandemic. I don't think this is necessarily the right time um, uh, for a car-free zone. And if we have a car-free zone, we really need to, um, to, to uh, we can make say online platforms, for example, that makes it easier for people to book, to order uh, goods from our local businesses instead of or booking, order, ordering stuff from Amazon, for example. So there are things that, like that we can do, but uh, we have to be very careful of um, our local shops. So 
So as a city center representative, I feel like um, you're making a good point, um, but it also depends on what you're trying to buy. Um, if I'm only wanting to buy bread, I don't need to take my car to drive to bakery to buy bread. If it's already pretty close and I can take my bike, that's a lot easier because taking a car in the city might is often very stressful and it's hard to find a parking spot anyway, so it's easier to just take the car, no, to take the bike and drop the car. So then to jump in as a suburban resident, um, for me to not use the car to go to the shop is a, is a massive mission. Um, I have to cross major highways. Uh, there's no really any public transport to get there. It's, it's really complicated uh, and would make my life very difficult if I couldn't jump in my car and, get, and go to the shop. And also in general, um, practically speaking, not being able to use my car would make my life very difficult. Dropping off kids, being able to go to my soccer practice on Saturdays and seeing my aunt in the sub in the other suburb on the other side of the city. I wouldn't be able to live the life that I want to live um, if I wasn't able to have my car. A reaction as a, a environmental activist, um, we all have to change the way we live. There is a big crisis coming. Um, and uh, we think that even the suburban citizens said that there are buses enough. We understand that it can be difficult, but we really think that you should invest in taking the bus and it's really possible. I would also like to highlight that it sounds like a bit of a failure of the citizen, uh, no, sorry, <laughs> of the urban planner. Because if you are struggling to cross streets, that sounds like maybe both the politicians and the, the um, urban planners haven't really given this enough thought and don't really care enough about, you know, the, the people in the communities and they should really engage in more in-depth communication with what the residents actually need. Like we've been sending email after email to the local politicians saying that these road crossings are dangerous. Like there are way too many cars, they're going way too fast. We've actually had serious accidents along several of the streets in Bergen. This is partially a problem caused by cars. If we actually get better uh, gosh, what's the word? Pavement, uh, better opportunities for people to, to walk and to cycle, we can actually reduce the amount of lethal and harmful accidents along several of Bergen's major streets. So this is something that the urban planner has to take serious. Please answer our emails. <laughs> As an urban planner, I'd like to say that the activists should really organize themselves into a bus riders union <laughs> um, because it's easier for us to deal with the um, uh, organized um, voices. And uh, I would like to respond to the politician that there's no research to support that uh, car-free zones are bad for businesses. And in London and Oslo, they proved that businesses act, uh, did better in the car-free zones. Um, from an activist point of view, uh, we would like to see the, the data, like uh, we are talking about digitalization, we want transparency, we want to see where the money are going. Please. Okay, sorry, also as a local activist. This local activist group is <laughs> in urban, um, citizens. We understand that having children and having a full-time job and all of that can be difficult, but there are other ways of, of moving around that could be incentivized by the city. So you can have car sharing, you can have reduced bus passes, your children can ride for free on the weekends, you know, the train could be more accessible. And also when we keep talking about these car-free zone, make sure that a suburban area has a supermarket, has a pharmacy, has a wine monopoly. Very important in these times so that you don't have to travel to go to these shops and get your, your key requirements kind of met during a busy child full So again, as a, a local politician, I've read those studies that show that um, uh, you know local businesses are not necessarily hurt by by car-free zones. 
but the voters have not read those studies. Uh, so whenever we, someone from my party talks about car free zones, uh, there's a lot of skepticism from the voters. So it's a real problem with this information. And I think there's this fear um, of uh, what's going to happen uh, if, if the municipality puts in place new restrictions. I think it's really uh, upon the, the municipality uh, and the urban planners to, put, to, to present this information uh, about these car free zones in, in a good way, in a, in a way that doesn't scare um, the residents uh, and make them think that uh, it's just a bunch of new restrictions um, being you know, pulled over their heads. Um, Does it help that um, Bergen Centrum AS also advocates for car free zones? Yeah, it could, that could help. As a local politician, I also would like to ask for help to the urban planner, because by investing in some and creating these zones, I am really concerned about state-led gentrification. So I think the urban planners need to consider how can we design a city that doesn't harm the people living close to these areas by rising up the prices of the area. As an uh, environmental activist, in reaction to one uh, speaker earlier, the right-wing uh, politician, and um, we as activists have actually have a plan. We haven't started it yet, but uh, we would like maybe the support of the city council for that to go door by door, ring on the doorbell, and because we know that many people don't believe the research, they don't believe in the science, and we want to talk to them at the door and convince them that the science is uh, is true, and in that way maybe help to uh, communicate uh, the scientific research. So if city council's interested, um, we'd like to help you with that. As a suburban dweller, I would just like to say, please, please come to our door and ring it. I mean, I'm not interested. And I think, Go ahead. Um, as a suburb dweller and, and uh, speaking back to the activists, you're saying we all have to change our ways. So am I as a suburban dweller who cannot afford uh, to move to the, to the city center because the prices are, t are too high uh, and I've got um, three kids and I need, need space. Am I supposed to uh, ditch my car? Um, and spend probably three times as much time commuting. Uh, my kids won't be able to do the same kind of after school activities. And uh, I will have less time with my kids uh, because I'll be spending time commuting to and from work. Um, while you in the city center potentially um, and those who don't have kids have a much easier context. And so have I have got to sacrifice my standard of living uh, as someone who's kind of at the at the bottom of the of the pay scale and who can't afford uh, changing uh, changing my life in, in a way that makes this transition uh, comfortable and enjoyable for me. As an environmental activist, uh, yes, I think we all have to offer some standard of living that's uh, saving the environment, um, but. We, uh, we totally understand all your worries and maybe uh, when we go door by door and when you do open the door, maybe we can also um, collect your worries and bring them to the city council. Because as some of my fellow uh, activists said, we are also critiquing the city council and the urban planners. We think they're not creating uh, the, the opportunities and, the, and, the, and the, well, the resources in the suburban area. So we would like to collect your info and bring them back to the city council. As another activist, <laughs> we're a very vocal group. <laughs> uh, you, you say that you would lose a lot of opportunities and you wouldn't be able to live the same kind of life, but now you make it seem as if we are simply re uh, removing your access to things without creating new things in the process. Like we would create new localized spaces where your children can 
you know, have other friend groups and participate in other social activities that maybe previously were limited to those urban centers where there was enough space for them. By freeing up the space that is now used for cars, we can create local spaces for you. We can help you and your children to reconnect and form a better sense of community, which has also been proven time and time again to be beneficial to mental and physical health. I don't see that this would purely be a sacrifice, but by cooperating with you guys and by investigating the needs of each local community, we can find good ways to use these new spaces to ensure a pretty decent, at least, quality of life. Nice to see lots of uh, lots of really interesting perspectives flowing thick and fast. We're approaching the end of uh, what, uh, at least uh, just listening, um, has been a really uh, engaging and uh, useful workshop and I think it's nice um, just to use the last bit of time to ask uh, Katinka and Devin to uh, share their reflections um, on what we've just witnessed and if anybody from uh, from the participants would also like to say something outside of your stakeholder role some burning uh, question or comment um, or um, or something that you feel did not uh, get said then please feel free um, so I perhaps uh, ask Katinka first to reflect for a couple of minutes. Meanwhile, I'll also share a couple of links on the chat if anybody wants to look up uh, our work and uh, we'll post the video from today, um, later today as well. Also, the first link is to uh, the mock-up website. So if there is somebody who wants to um, organize one of the groups, um, the bus users, then that's an open challenge to uh, do that. Devin, um, sorry, Katinka first and then Devin. Okay, thanks, Sid. Um, I think, um, first of all, it's been really fascinating to see um, all the issues that have come up uh, in these debates uh, that have reflected a lot of what we've been talking about over the last couple of months uh, when we've been looking at the, the issues in Bergen. Um, and one thing I wanted to pick up on was that um, urban planner failure that someone brought up in relation to the suburbs and not being able to to move around easily without a car um, because i think what is what is what the urban planners are facing today is is the the um, the legacy of the old system which was centered around cars especially in the city like bergen where car was seen as the mode of transport and your and your suburban areas have been constructed around this, this notion. And so the we could call it now urban planner failure, but I think the, the urban planners are really facing uh, a big challenge in terms of big infrastructure that is already in place and and that needs uh, needs to to change. And then I also wanted to, to mention another challenge that um, hasn't come up, which relates to uh, mandates and where the mandates for different planning aspects sit. So in relation to public transport in the context of Norway or in the context then of Bergen, this to a large extent sits with the county, not with the municipality. So in terms of buses as, as well as the light rail rollout, uh, the key responsibility sits with, uh, with the county. And so so there's, there's really a challenge there of different mandates sitting at different scales and how do we address that? Thank you. So Just yeah. before moving to Devin, I see that Tor would like to have a short uh, comment. Please go ahead. I'll be really brief. I just wanted to um, um, share with you guys something Agnes brought up in our small group, which is that there's a systemic challenge um, for participation uh, related to what Katinka just said about mandates, that by the time they get to public participation, the, most of the big decisions have been made. Um, so we might need to rethink, um, and, and maybe this is a challenge to the activists, that there needs to be more pressure and more bottom-up um, organizing uh, if, if you wanna actually have a real say in, in how this thing unfolds. Tor. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I just want to point it out uh, at the end, uh, the, the focus on SDGs, and that is the Sustainable Goals, the 17, and also the goals which is implemented in each nation's transportation planning. 
in Norway, we have a national transport plan which consists of a goal picture, but the relation between the SDGs and these national transport plan pictures are not that obvious at all. And we are different people uh, from a professional point of view, we are working to integrate those uh, two, uh, let's say, goal pictures. In addition to that, you all know about the EU's taxonomy concerning SDGs involved in business life. And that has to do with uh, what, what is called the three-dimension bottom line of private companies, where there are also processes uh, taking, taking place at the moment. And I must say that concerning business life, this taxonomy of the European Union, it's very interesting to keep track on that and to implement it in business life. Thank you. Thank you, Thor. Um, Katerina, would you like to share your, your thoughts as well? And then I think I will draw it to a close. Yeah, I mean, pretty much just what I wrote, which is just more of a practical question of who is responsible for the financial aspect of all of this which is more just, I genuinely don't know, so I'm curious. <laughs> like what, what kind of costs are we even looking at and who would have to pay for this? I think that's a good question to, uh, to leave suspended for, uh, for people to look into. I think it's worth mentioning that we would have to consider it alongside the kinds of infrastructural investments, the scale and scope of them that go into uh, larger road networks, tunnels, and uh, and other kinds of uh, urban mobility infrastructure projects. So, just in the last uh, minute or two here, I'd uh, I'd like to say that we are really happy with the sort of engagement that we see um, today, and that we know that there are a number of people uh, who care about urban mobility who are engaged in their cities, and that's really important for our work within the responsive organizing for low emission societies project within other work going on at the center for climate and energy transformation um, certainly within my group at the university of stavanger as well on energy environment and society and uh, we'd be very happy if any of you wanted to discuss this further to share your thoughts just get in touch with us we're easy to find um, and uh, we will over the next several years keep uh, open opportunities for recurring engagement. It's a big ambition for us to also uh, share our findings and uh, have reflections on them from those whom uh, we hope to bring into the larger participatory conversation. And that includes very much a close uh, working relationship with the municipality and other decision makers. Uh, and we're looking forward to sharing uh, today's workshop with them as well. So thank you for being here. Um, thanks for your contributions. And uh, we hope to stay in touch. Have a great uh, Great day ahead and enjoy the rest of day zero. Howard, would you like to have the closing word? <clears throat> no, actually not. <laughs> All right. I was just uh, engaging in the, uh, the uh, chat there. Uh, that, so what's the cost of the car-free zones? And, and um, yeah, let's not get into the very detailed things, but I think there are some very um, in inspiring examples uh, of where uh, cities have just kind of uh, taken a part of a road or a, even indiv individual roads, painted them red. <laughs> um, look at uh, Times Square, for example. Or Google Times Square, before and after. Thank yeah. you. All right, so uh, thanks everyone. Enjoy the rest of day zero. Stay in touch, that's, uh, that's it from us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.